rainy, rainy day, rainy evening. Um, this evening, Anthony Flint, author of Modern Man, The Life of Le Corbusier, Architect of Tomorrow, will explore how, in a rapidly urbanizing world, there are lessons to be learned from Le Corbusier. His mass, mass produced housing design and his appreciation of density and planning of the regional scale are relevant and applicable to modern city planning in the way we live today. We do have copies of Modern Man, $20 available at the end of the lecture if you are interested. And I think Anthony might even sign them for us. Absolutely. <laughs> a little bit about our presenter. Anthony Flint is a fellow and director of public affairs at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy think tank in Cambridge. His previous books include Wrestling with Moses, how Jane Jacobs took on New York's master builder and transformed the American city, which won a Christopher Award in 2010, and This Land, The Battle Over Sprawl and the Future of America. Flint has been a journalist for 30 years, primarily at the Boston Globe, and a policy advisor on smart growth for the Massachusetts state government. He was a visiting scholar and Loeb Fellow at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, a writer in resident at residence at the American Library in Paris, and a fellow at the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Center. He earned his BA from Middlebury College and an MS from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Anthony lives in Brookline with his wife and children, and Brookline Adult and Community Education is proud to invite him to our Brookline Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you, Anthony. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, I want to uh, begin by showing a few images, and some of them will be instantly uh, recognized as uh, uh, quite local, appropriately, for uh, this uh, program, uh, fantastic lecture series put on uh, by uh, the Brookline uh, Adult and uh, Community Education. Um, so, this is familiar, right? Right around the corner? Just down the street, also uh, at the foot of uh, Walnut Street. Of course, the Christian Science Center. This is in Harvard Square in Cambridge, but noting the Pilo T and the uh, uh, strip windows. Boston City Hall, of course, which the late mayor Tom Menino said would make a great handball court. <laughs> <laughs> Riverview uh, apartment building uh, on uh, Mount Armored Street in Cambridge. This is an alewife, but could be anywhere with its uh, corporate office park typology. Uh, does anyone know where this is? It's uh, Fall River City Hall, mm -hmm. um, quite similar to Boston City Hall. This is in Providence, Rhode Island, um, just down Huntington Avenue in uh, uh, the Brigham. And this, of course, is the FBI building, which is uh, a lot of people would like to take a wrecking ball to it uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, but it perseveres. And then, of course, um, John Hancock, the building by uh, IMK, and um, its predecessor, arguably, or I will pose, uh, the United Nations building in New York City. So what I hope to illustrate tonight uh, is that so much of our landscape all around us, for better or worse, uh, has been influenced by this man, Le Corbusier. Born Charles Edouard Genere in 1887 in a watchmaking town in northwestern Switzerland, he moved to Paris to become part of the Roaring Twenties uh, and rebranded himself with that single moniker. It's taken from a family name, uh, but it also translates loosely to the Raven the mythic and acrobatic bird of Celtic lore. And he set out to revolutionize uh, design space, the way we live, and the way we inhabit cities. One of the first to marshal the power of public relations, he was, I would argue, 
an original star architect and founding father of modern architecture. Though in the US, arguably the more recognized figure is, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright. The two men were rivals uh, of a sort, though Wright uh, actually rebuffed Le Corbusier's uh, offer to meet with him in person. Uh, Le Corbusier was in Chicago, and Wright was in, Mil in Milwaukee, or just outside Milwaukee, and he said it was too far. <laughs> um, uh, as I picture this rivalry, I think about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright as Bill Gates and Le Corbusier as Steve Jobs. Yeah. Inc incidentally, a little known fact is that uh, the Carbusier uh, submitted a um, proposal for the Guggenheim, pictured here, um, and also uh, sketched a series of continuous ramps, uh, but the structure was square. The architect, the creator of the built environment, has such enduring appeal today with such figures as Frank Gehry, Rem Kuhas, Renzo Piano, Zaha Hadid, and Le Corbusier was a true, uh, a true pioneer. He was an original disruptor, pragmatic, opportunistic, and fundamentally non-ideological in the conventional sense. He was a master of reinvention, uh, working in his atelier as the equivalent of the startup in a, in a garage, experimenting, challenging the status quo, and expertly, if rather assertively, delegating the execution of his vision to a loyal team. In Modern Man, I've sought to write a narrative biography of genius to get inside this man's head and uh, look at what makes him tick and what drove him. Uh, it's a bit like what I might do, and indeed, uh, I confess, would yearn to do, and that's write a biography of Tom Brady um, <laughs> to uh, give a sense of what it's like to making those split decisions in the pocket uh, on such a grand stage. Uh, but this uh, is not about an ar uh, a quarterback, but an architect. And just a word about my other uh, books. My, my, my first books have really been all about a quest to tell stories about the built environment and architecture and urban design and urban planning and to try to interest a broader audience uh, in the challenges facing our cities. Um, the, the, the gambit as well has been to bridge the world of the think tank, academia, journalism, and contemporary book writing and publishing. Uh, this helps answer the question of why in the world would I research and write a book about a man who has been so thoroughly studied. There have been many books about Le Carbusier. <coughs> Almost all of them divided up into specialties. Uh, a book about the churches he built, uh, about him growing up in Switzerland, the architect in the beach, the architect as feminist, the architect in America. But my conclusion was this subject was too rich, too wonderful to be squandered in the academy. As such, Modern Man is not a scholarly or technical uh, work. Uh, it's, um, it's possible to read this narrative without having any idea who this man was, and least of all armed with knowledge about modernism and modern architecture as uh, sometimes unnecessarily intimidating as that may be. The Carbusier would always lecture without notes, doing a kind of a PowerPoint on the fly, uh, using reams of newsprint like this. Uh, I've structured the book so the story of his life is told not so much in a uh, linear chronological fashion, but rather an exploration of rooms in a memory palace. In my own modest way, I've sought to design the narrative a bit like one of Le Carbusier's buildings, a process of theatrical discovery. Well, to give you a sense of the early influences in his life, um, let's take a bit of uh, uh, that journey here, beginning with Le Chaux de Fonds. Uh, this is the town in Switzerland where he was born. It's a remote place. Le Corbusier was eager to get out of there as soon as possible, uh, much like Le Chaux de Fonds' other famous son, Louis Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. um, this is just one of the uh, fun facts that you'll come away with tonight, uh, which are very useful for cocktail parties. Um, the city did have great influence. Um, it was destroyed by fire in the late 19th century and rebuilt with an orderly street grid and buildings set at regular um, distances similar to those in Hausmann's Paris. Uh, the idea was to allow abundant light to shine in at the top floor ateliers 
where the watchmaking was done. Le Chaudafon is the origin of such leading brands as uh, Breitling and Mavado. It was clear from early on that this young man had a talent for drawing and conveying the visual. In the local art school, he studied under the master Charles Le Platonier, who encouraged him to give architecture a try. His father wanted him to follow in his footsteps uh, and engrave watch cases, a destiny that was made impossible in part because of a condition that essentially left him blind in one eye. Le Chaudafon was where he built his first villas, Villa Fallet, Villa Schwab, a theater, and ultimately this terrific uh, house that he built for his parents uh, up on a hill at the outskirts of town. Maison Blanche is open for tours to this day, and as you walk inside, uh, though it was completed in 1912, uh, it's clear how truly modern it is. That's his uh, father, uh, George's boater and cane hanging in the entryway. Well, Maison Blanche ended up being too much house for the Genres, and so the faithful son designed another place for their retirement. Villa Le Lac, or uh, the Petite Maison, on the shores of Lake Geneva, in Veve on the Swiss ri Riviera. Uh, Veve is home to uh, uh, the adopted hometown of uh, Charlie Chaplin, uh, mm -hmm. as well as Nestle. See, these are more fun facts to store away. Um, here at Villa Le Lac, the minimalist and efficient modern design is seen in full flourish. Uh, it featured a a hideaway guest bed and compact kitchen where Marie, who outlived his father by many decades, would wash the dishes and watch the boats go by on Lake Geneva. Not content to pro provide any ordinary back patio, the Carbusier installed uh, the feature on the left as well, framing the landscape of lake and mountains. As a young man, encouraged by Le Platonier, uh, he hit the road with a friend <coughs> on the equivalent of a European backpacking tour, drinking in monasteries in Italy, which would influence his housing design and the ultimate mesmerizing destination, the Acropolis, which instilled in him a uh, flair for the monumental. Well, there was never a question that he had to be in Paris. He talked his way into an internship with the Pere brothers, who were experimenting with the use of concrete, and Peter Behrens, who with Walter Gropius and a, another intern, Mies van der Rohe, would help establish, of course, the German design school, the Bauhaus. He moved to the Latin Quarter, uh, St. Germain, to 20 Rue Jacob, frequenting the bistros of Hemingway and Coco Chanel. Here he is in Paris during his first foray, a voracious reader and a bit of a loner, painting Notre Dame by day and inclined to pay to slake his thirst for sex at night. He's an odd duck, but he'll interest you, August Perret told the artist and collector Amade Osenfant, who would become Le Corbusier's close friend and collaborator in those early years. With this picture, I can't resist suggesting that um, Brad Pitt might play him in the movie version of the book. Well, he sought to join the avant-garde in Paris, uh, not initially entirely through architecture, but rather through painting, uh, something he loved and did all his life. Uh, with Oz Ozenfant, he founded the journal L'Esprit Nouveau, ushering in the era of the modern. Uh, but he uh, uh, put the brush to canvas uh, quite a bit in those uh, years, and here he is hanging out with, among others, the painter Fernand Léger. In Paris, though, he ultimately made a name for himself, designing villas such as this one for his friend Osenfant in the 14th arrondissement that revolutionized the flow and function of interior space, stripped the Victorian era ornamentation of the exterior as well. White was the color of choice for these so-called purest villas, and he built houses uh, for Gertrude Stein's brother and another American client on the outskirts of Paris. Through the 1920s, he established his architectural practice with two of the most loyal members of the team, cousin Pierre Generet and furniture designer Charlotte Parion. We don't embroider cushions here. Le Corbusier sniffed when she first came to the atelier <laughs> looking for work. Um, 
the atelier was at uh, 35 Rue de Sèvres near the Hotel Lutetia and the, uh, the uh, Le Bon Marché department store. Uh, but of course, uh, he instantly recognized her talent and hired her in short order. In Paris, he innovated alongside Chanel and Gertrude Stein, Picasso, Leger, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Gershwin. Not only villas, but furniture, something he's perhaps uh, quite well known for in this country. Um, copies of his stuffed leather armchair are ubiquitous in waiting rooms and corporate offices. Um, he also dabbled in women's clothes, and with cousin Pierre, even designed a car, mm -hmm. the original Mini pictured here, and uh, actually the precursor to the Volkswagen Beetle. Mm -hmm. The villas paid the bills, but he was uh, never content to build only standalone homes. He sought to make housing in the form of apartment buildings mass produced and easily repeatable, seeing the urgent need for more order in accommodating the many people moving into cities, and many, many of them living in substandard conditions and slums. Those existed in Paris uh, at that time, uh, as they did in New York City, just as they do in places like Rio today. The aspiration of repeatable, pre-manufactured housing is seen first in the domino scheme at the top, presaging the lift slab construction technique by many decades, and the Maison Citroën uh, at the bottom. The worker housing in Passac, uh, designed for a sugar baron, is inhabited to this day of density roughly equivalent to Kentlands in Maryland. And then there was this, uh, his most audacious proposal in 1925, uh, where he takes things to the next level or perhaps in retrospect gets a little carried away, uh, the 60-story housing towers of Plan Voisin, uh, uh, initially the city for three million people. Um, it was uh, proposed for about two square miles in the very heart of Paris, uh, a grid of arterials, a separation of the car and the pedestrian, even a few helipads. Uh, who knows what wonder, wonders future metropolis might, uh, might entail. The theoretical scheme was targeted for the district of the Marais, admittedly uh, quite run down at the time, uh, and he promised that important civic and religious buildings would somehow be preserved, uh, but as I write in the book, he felt he needed to destroy the city in order to save it. Well, he was making his mark and uh, well on his way to becoming a celebrity. Uh, governments around the world sought his consultation, just as one example in South America and Argentina and Brazil. He relished being on the road, traveling in style on ocean liners and in dirigibles and ultimately in some of the first passenger planes. Uh, he'd step off onto the tarmac and Natalie dressed, as, as always, in his suit, bow tie, pocket square, and trademark round black eyeglasses. And he was, as always, ready for romance. Here I'd like to take a moment to read from the introduction on the occasion of him meeting the jazz singer Josephine Baker. He watched her for what seemed like hours, her chest rising and falling as the big boat did the same on the waves of the Atlantic. They left Rio de Janeiro for the long trip back to France, uh, nestled in crisp white sheets on the Lutetia. Time was a relative matter as the ship made a vector for the equator. The year was 1929. The roaring 20s were about to come to an end with the stock market crash, but no such realities would intervene in that state run. Propped up on one elbow, he could hardly believe his good fortune, meeting Josephine Baker in Buenos Aires several days before. In Rio, they sipped Caprinas and sauntered along Ipanema Beach, and she was so lovely, he created portraits of her using the colored pencils he had brought for work. On board, they attended an elaborate costume party. He dressed as an Indian soldier with polka dot bandana. She is a China doll. What a pity you're an architect, Monsieur Le Corbusier, she had said. You'd have made a sensational partner. <laughs> <laughs> well, he uh, ultimately ends up, uh, uh, he, he never fully settles down, as we'll see shortly, but uh, he did 
uh, marry this woman, Yvonne Gallus, a fashion model from Monaco. Uh, Yvonne was a gypsy spirit who loved practical jokes, at one point setting down a whoopee cushion under uh, a visiting uh, prelate. Uh, interestingly, she forbade the discussion of architecture in her home, and uh, so uh, they, they didn't have a lot in common professionally. Um, and ultimately, she spent many long days while her husband traveled the world, smoking cigarettes and sipping pastis earlier and earlier in the day. Oops. Back in Paris, in the suburbs outside of town, uh, beginning around 1929, he created the architectural equivalent of the iPhone, the Villa Savoie, uh, based on his five points of architecture, raise the building up on pilotis, use the roof as a garden, make the interior an open plan, enable uh, by the freedom from uh, structural elements, free up the facade from functional requirements and ornamentation, and use horizontal windows to let in light. Here he was in the sweet spot of his disruptive innovation using concrete as, build, as the building material and pushing the limits of construction methods. One of his notable accomplishments as well was to push architecture and urban planning and urban design at the time into the realm of the political. Uh, the uh, International Congress for Modern Architecture, or SIAM, a lobbying arm for modernism to gain more acceptance of the modern vision for cities among local governments worldwide. It's notable that the new professional uh, association and advocacy group are relatively new, tw about 20 years old. The new urbanists uh, call themselves as well uh, the Congress for the New Urbanism. It was actually taken directly from SIAM, complete with a charter similar to the Charter of Athens, the guiding document or manifesto of the group. Here he is on a boat on his way uh, to one of the many raucous convenings of uh, the International Congress. Well, World War II interrupted his ascent and, of course, everyone else's, and set the stage for the darker chapter of his life. Um, he traveled to the spa town of Vichy to ingratiate himself with the collaborationist government, hoping to become a kind of minister of urbanism. Um, his attempts at networking there amid the cox berets and sidearms and Machiavellian maneuvering ultimately proved fruitless, and he moved back to Paris. But the chapter detailing this time is aptly called The Opportunist, and that he was. Um, he was courted by Mussolini uh, and worked in the Soviet Union, uh, building a major complex in Moscow and another that was not executed, the Palace of Soviets, which is pictured here. And all of this led to uh, the fact that he, he was criticized at one point for being a capitalist, a communist, and a fascist all at the same time. Uh, he was, as always, chasing the commission. The end of the war brought him back to America, which he first visited in 1935. At that time, he disembarked from the SS Normandy, expecting to be greeted like a hero, something that did not happen. And his, uh, his guide actually had to bribe a photographer to snap um, picture, to pretend to snap pictures of him. Uh, the photographer said, "Sure, I'll do it," but actually, there's no film in the camera. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, his uh, his guide said, "Just just do it and make him happy." And of course, for the next few days, he was constantly asking, "Where are my pictures? Why am I not in the newspaper?" Well. The visitor from Paris um, lectured at MoMA and critiqued American skyscrapers. Skyscrapers not big enough, blared one headline. Uh, he traveled to Boston, uh, where he met a young man named I.M. Pei, and to Chicago and Michigan, where he met uh, with Ira Saarinen and marveled at the River Rouge auto assembly plan. He was most welcome, actually, at college campuses where students flocked around him for autographs. Now that was more like it. He came away quite soured on America and wrote a book called When Cathedrals Were White, 
but he agreed to join the design by committee team for the new UN complex on the banks of the East River. He's ultimately unhappy that he alone uh, doesn't get all the credit for leading the process, uh, but the iconic end result is essentially his design. Here he is, uh, a had a picture taken of himself showing uh, his original uh, drawings and how, how similar they were to the, to the end result. Again, back in France, incredibly, uh, befriending Charles de Gaulle and his ministers in the campaign of post-war reconstruction, he completes his comeback with Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. 337 apartments in a radical new interlocking <laughs> configuration, a masterful design of density. In the upper left is a picture of Picasso, who toured the complex while it was under construction, joined in a rare appearance by Yvonne, but she clearly didn't want to miss that chance. Uh, this was unlike anything that anyone had uh, in France had, had really seen. It had a supermarket, shops, a cinema, all within the building, a gym, uh, and gardens, and a waiting pool on the rooftop. There will be no divorces in my house, he proclaimed. <laughs> this vertical city, the Ville Redieuse, was to be a happy hive. He's in full swagger here. I love this picture of him and Picasso. Shirts unbuttoned nearly to the waist, completely <laughs> gratuitously. Uh, but still, he was revolutionizing his own art, uh, the way people live. Unité d'habitation was based on the new system of measurement Le Corbusier had established the modular, the blueprint for livable design. Um, it's an almost mystical mathematical foundation for visual pleasure and the accommodation of humans in space uh, that can be traced to Sanskrit texts, the Fibonacci sequence, and in a more popular reference, the Da Vinci Code. With its preoccupation with the golden mean, the modular was intended to be used by everyone and anyone, open source some 50 years before the term is now in its familiar use. Albert Einstein, uh, here meeting with uh, Le Corbusier in Princeton, praised the modular for making the difficult easy. Unité d'habitation helps land him on the cover of Time magazine. And as a work of architecture, um, around the same time, of course, the chapel at Ronchamp would seal his position as a pioneer. Catholic Church commissioned a man who had no use for organized religion, mm -hmm. but like Blake writing Jerusalem, the end result is an otherworldly structure of staggering beauty on a hilltop in eastern France, not too far from uh, uh, the border with Switzerland uh, and his hometown of Le Chaudefond. The interior, pictured here, with light punching through the concrete wall, um, through painted glass, and then here, of course, um, uh, some way south by Lyon, um, the monastery at La Tourette, uh, recently <coughs> restored and rehabilitated to the great credit of the French government, uh, and the destination virtually every day of crowds of architecture students from the world over. It's an intricate and pure work of architecture. Le Corbusier was actually delighted to discover that one small feature had been installed incorrectly um, and that was fine he said because it would underscore the fact that this building was created by man and not a god as uh, many uh, might think. Here I am uh, uh, displaying the pose of the modular man for a group of uh, Japanese architecture students who uh, snapped away at, because uh, I'm right about the, the, the height of the modular man is about six feet. And these were, these were masterpieces to be sure, but uh, through the 1950s, uh, Carbusier got his big chance to design and build an entire city from scratch. Uh, Prime Minister Nehru commissioned him to create the needed new provincial capital of Chandigarh, north of New Delhi. Uh, which was uh, supposed to be an announcement of India's arrival in the modern world following partition. And so here I'd like to make a final reading, very briefly, uh, the beginning of the chapter on Chandigarh, 
which I've titled simply, The City. The Air India jet banked over the Himalayan plains, tilting the first class cabin toward an expansive view of the northern region all the way up toward the foothills in Shimla, the former summertime capital of the Raj. Rivers appeared as long muddy ribbons with a thin stream of water in the center. The long stretches of flat khaki colored land were sprinkled with clusters of green bushes and trees and a few huts here and there. And Le Corbusier looked down and remembered how he had, in a similar fashion of, from the Graf Zeppelin, surveyed Brazil 20 years and a lifetime ago. That was a different kind of chaos, the rivers meandering wildly through the jungle. Now, over India, he leaned close to the jet's oval window and pictured a grid to organize humanity, an order to be imposed on an increasingly crowded nation <coughs> and grand monuments befitting the new republic. The blank canvas was before him. There was earth to be moved. Mm -hmm. Here's the parliament building at Chandigarh. And finally, back in America, uh, and the only uh, building by Le Corbusier in North America, the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts on the campus of Harvard University, uh, this building uh, recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. Le Corbusier visited uh, only twice and collaborated with his old friend, uh, Jose Luis Sert, then the dean of uh, Harvard's architecture school. But he did not attend the ribbon cutting. He was spending more and more time here in Roquebrun Cap Martin. Architecture is hard, he was fond of saying, and this hard-charging man needed a getaway. He found that in the south of France, um, in this seaside village between Monaco and the Italian border. And that's where he designed the cabinon for himself, based on the principles of the modular. He and Yvonne would spend days drinking wine and eating sea, sea urchins uh, at the adjoining restaurant, La Toile de Mer. And daily, Le Corbusier would go for a long swim in the open sea. His introduction to Rockford and Cap Martin was by way of staying at Villa E1027 by the designer Eileen Gray, who disagreed with Le Corbusier's adage that the home was a machine for living in. Gray's lover at the time let Le Corbusier stay there, and he promptly wore out his welcome, uh, painting a series of racy murals, uh, as it happens, of course, in the nude, as you see here. Um, this part of the story, by the way, I, I uh, recently wrote about for Architect Magazine uh, because Villa E1027 has been uh, recently restored and is now part of a, uh, a campus called Cap Mardin. It's also the subject of a film that <coughs> debuted this year at the Dublin Film Festival uh, called The Price of Desire. Mm -hmm. Well, Rockford and Cap Martin, where Coco Chanel also had a villa further up the hill, uh, was uh, a true highlight in researching this book. It was hard work, someone had to do it. It's a, it's a magical place and a wonderful, soothing assault on the senses of sight and smell and sound. The Corbusier said he would likely end his days there, and indeed he did, uh, when on August 25th, 1965, exactly 50 years ago uh, last month, uh, he walked to the sea one final time from his cabin on, against doctor's orders to quit swimming because of a heart condition. Mm -hmm. Somewhere out there on those rolling waves, the end came, uh, with perhaps uh, sea urchins dotting the floor mm -hmm. uh, before everything faded to black. Mm -hmm. So, a colorful life and well lived, um, but what about the elephant in the room? How can mm -hmm. one celebrate this man? He proposed bulldozing the center of Paris. <laughs> um, he was an opportunist to align himself with some of history's most despicable characters. Mm -hmm. He was responsible for a culture of top-down planning, where today it's all about participatory, participatory planning and citizen engagement. Uh, he gave us towers in the park, blank walls, and embraced the separation of uses. He sought to kill the street when we all know today it's all about the street a mix of uses and a human scale. He was paternalistic, chauvinistic, a serial philanderer, and he was French. 
<laughs> Though born in Switzerland, he became a French citizen in 1930. Um, the towers in the park, uh, in particular, has become a, a symbol of sorts of the utter failure of planning, of getting things exactly wrong uh, in, uh, in terms of anticipating how humans would enjoy and occupy space. Um, efforts through the 1960s and 70s, uh, in the news in recent times for being the breeding ground for terrorists uh, in the, in, here in the suburbs, suburbs of Paris, seems also to fall squarely into the category of seemed like a good idea at the time, but in practice uh, became a, a havens for drug dealers and crime. The, the best of intentions gone wrong. So right up front, modern man is warts and all for all his inspirational moves. He had several truly bad ideas. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the many of the ideas were uh, uh, translated into quite an imperfect vision um, that was um, uh, manifested through some deeply flawed uh, copies. His system of arterials and elevated urban freeways uh, inspired mostly indirectly the windswept plazas and highway-centric planning of the era of urban renewal. Among others, uh, the master builder Robert Moses took up the cause of greater density in the quest to increase housing supply in the city. The end of the 20th century, indeed, belongs more to this woman, Jane Jacobs, who was uh, the heroine of uh, my book, Wrestling with Moses. But here's one fact to keep in mind. The world that we're seeing unfold um, requires, I argue, a basic level of planning um, where, as a practical matter, multiple versions of Greenwich Village will be unable to accommodate the burgeoning urban population. So the uh, world population today is about 6 billion. Over half of those people live in cities. By 2050, the world's population is expected to be 9 billion, and more than two-thirds, 6 billion people, will live in cities. 2.5 billion people will move to cities between now and 2030. Some 3 billion will need housing, basic infrastructure, services, and this incredible and unprecedented urban expansion um, is uh, occurring primarily in sub-Saharan Africa and Asian, Asia in uh, the places that are least equipped uh, to deal with it. 400 million people will be added to India's population alone. That's an entire additional United States. Um, so take us and double it. But don't put anyone in places like Nebraska. Uh, the 21st century is the urban century. Uh, and um, all of these people will be residing in cities. These population counts from 2000 will look downright manageable by comparison. Uh, virtually all the growth occurring in the developing world um, uh, as uh, largely poor uh, migrants moving to the cities from rural areas in search of a better life. Uh, examples of the four fastest growing cities are Lagos, Dhaka, Karachi, and Mumbai. Mumbai, staggering in its chaos today will grow easily to over 40 million people. Beijing, of course, will do the same. And at least 100 second cities in China that will sprout to the, um, that will sprout to the population of 10 million or more. And the default uh, for all this urban expansion is this, slums, favelas, shanty towns, without basic services such as water and sanitation. An estimated 1 billion people are currently living in such conditions. Mm -hmm. And UN Habitat estimates that in sub-Saharan Africa, easily two-thirds of all migrants are moving straight into informal settlement. There's very little preparation for this urban expansion, uh, which I, I would say is the central project of the 21st century, um, the fundamental challenge of human settlement. Uh, the United Nations and UN Habitat uh, is rightly focused on this topic uh, in planning for the Global Cities Summit called Habitat 3, which will take place next October in Quito. 
And we've done some work at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy on uh, preparing for a planet of cities, uh, establishing a grid like New York City's, um, uh, planning now for parks and open space, and uh, uh, making realis realistic projections uh, for uh, the need for ample urban land. So the current uh, bias against top-down planning uh, comes at a moment where a sense of scale will be critical. The idea that the idea here is that perhaps the pendulum has swung so fully to the importance of the human-scaled neighborhood that what might be lost is the need for big plans, framing the context in terms of infrastructure, regional collaboration, and planning for climate change. So Le Corbusier had that sense of, uh, uh, of a regional scale, but his best innovations, however, were in housing design. Efficiently, uh, in efficiency and density in repeated urban form. More than a half century later, we're seeing the trend of micro-housing. Uh, this is an example from a, a, a winning plan from uh, a recent competition in New York City. Um, uh, on, the, uh, on the left is a, a, a picture of a monastic cell from La Tourette, uh, where I stayed, and there's a, a similar uh, apartment in uh, the uh, Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, uh, a couple of floors of which have actually been converted to a hotel. And uh, the manager um, uh, told me that whenever she's showing the rooms to potential guests, if it's a couple, she pauses for a moment before entering a room like this and says, are you in love? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our uh, needs for um, uh, interior space are changing, uh, the city is at our doorstep, and uh, particularly singles, a growing part of the uh, demographic, uh, need less space, uh, and arguably many others do too as they, as they right size into uh, smaller living spaces. The Ark Engels group uh, fully attributes uh, uh, the inspiration to Le Corbusier in projects uh, such as the Eight House and well-designed density with urban amenities and walkable, transit-rich districts in our cities will be a key component in a more sustainable urbanism going forward. So uh, I'll leave you with this notion. Um, whether it's possible to create urban form in harmony with the landscape and an understanding of the enduring human relationship with nature, an elegant, nimble, comprehensive approach to design. Planning for scale, density, and efficiency as the hallmarks of the future. And an architecture of all the people, which he believed can be beautiful, as long as it serves a population whose lives it can improve. So to those who see nothing redeemable about this man, the audacious suggestion here is to refrain from throwing the baby out with the modernist bathwater <laughs> and to suggest that planning uh, today, um, today's planning and design challenges call for uh, a similar kind of disruption uh, and challenging thinking that Le Corbusier deployed. And uh, ultimately to avoid widespread suffering in these rapidly growing urban areas all around the world um, we need a, uh, an approach that results in resilience, particularly in the coastal areas uh, affected by climate change, where the most vulnerable populations are, uh, and um, a, a well-planned future with decent housing for all. So whether derided or, worst of all, from his perspective, a figure that is fading into obscurity, a reconsideration is in order. This enduring legacy applies not just for our contemporary American landscape, but uh, for more promise for the planet's future, as he may yet become the architect of tomorrow. He comes in peace. Thank you. So, I'd just like to take a moment to thank uh, the Lincoln Institute, of the Land, uh, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, where I'm a fellow and also 
uh, the American Library in Paris and the uh, Rockefeller <coughs> Foundation Bellagio Center. Uh, here's all my contact information. Uh, for those of you on Spotify, there's a playlist for uh, Modern Man. So you can, it's sort of a soundtrack for the book. That you can turn that on and, and listen to that music while you read. So in our remaining time, I, I would be delighted to uh, take questions and have a conversation and, um, uh, and, and take it from there. Um, would anyone like to go first? Yes, thank you. When did he die? Uh, in 1965, 50 years ago this summer. Uh, and and uh, Paris? Or? Uh, well, he, uh, he died in the south of France in that uh, when he went out for a swim against doctor's orders uh, because he had, he had been diagnosed uh, uh, just a few weeks before with a heart murmur, with a heart condition. Mm -hmm. And his doctor told him, you know, you absolutely should not be swimming in the Mediterranean. And, uh, and But he went for his daily swim anyway. There's some speculation at, that, that I get into a little bit in the book about whether it was, ki uh, you know, kind of a form of the suicide. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> He's in the 1920s. He had a world uh, reputation. How did he get it? He didn't build. Did he get it from writing or something? Um, well, he was a he was a master of PR. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you 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 raise a good point. Um, he leveraged uh, a, a lot of his uh, proposals uh, very expertly. So, at the uh, exposition in uh, uh, in 1925. Um, that's where he uh, unveiled his uh, plan voisin. And uh, they did it in a, uh, a, 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 um, a model of a modern house uh, that uh, was put together. Sadly, it was, um, it, it was destroyed, it was dismantled, you know, as uh, many things were in these kinds of expositions in, in those days. Um, uh, but he, um, he was very deft at, at, at getting attention uh, even when he just had stuff on paper. He had, though, by 1925, built these villas. Um, and and what, what he really wanted to do was break into, uh, uh, you know, a broader scale uh, uh, urban planning and, and building housing, you know, building an entire city. How did landscape design and, and his thoughts like the uh, effects of Olmsted and how did that interact with the density of housing and the need for public parks? Well, he, uh, he had some particular ideas about um, uh, open space and how, so if you take uh, Unité d'Habitation, for example, it's, it's uh, uh, raised up on, on these concrete pillars, and he thought that that would free up the ground level for circulation uh, and that um, and that people would uh, have a connection with the site uh, as such. Uh, it might have been a miscalculation because it's, you know, it's not particularly hospitable to be under this giant hulking thing. Um, but uh, uh, he, he was very much attuned to uh, sun and, and, and light and air uh, and envisioned this great density, um, which is behind this concept of towers in the park. Uh, amid open space and opportunities for recreation and uh, a relationship between the indoors and the outdoors. Uh, that was very much his, his, uh, part of his comprehensive approach to design. And uh, w when you see uh, 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 Chandigarh, um, uh, Ronchamp um, has a special relationship with the landscape. Uh, you, you can tell that he, he had the the sites in uh, um, the locations, Villa Savoie is very similar. This, the site was very much in his mind, the, the surrounding countryside. Yes? Uh, as you point out, he only had one commission in the United States. What influence, influences do you think he's had here, both in planning terms and perhaps in architectural terms? Well, when I showed those uh, pictures at the beginning, I was trying to uh, that, that, that uh, in a slightly sideways fashion, that there have been a lot of copycats and, and a lot of people who were inspired and went through the design professions in the 60s and 70s uh, were, were really Le Carbusier devotees. And, uh, and so 
you, you, you see a, a, a similar style in, in some of the, some of the uh, examples I showed. Uh, and I think his influence was extensive in, uh, through, through the era of urban renewal uh, and um, uh, gave us uh, arguably places like Boston City Hall and City Hall Plaza. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, highway building that went on um, was in, in many ways straight out of Le Corbusier um, and his schemes for places like Chandigarh, uh, but also from Plan Voisin. You know, Robert Moses had a proposal for the mid Manhattan Expressway, which would, would have run down 34th Street, mm -hmm. and it was an elevated uh, uh, expressway that. Um, uh, would have been, you know, sort of like cut through the um, third or fourth floor of uh, of buildings uh, in the grid, and uh, that was straight out of the Corbusier. Mm -hmm. If I can follow, in your study of Corbusier, do you see any relationship or influence with Louis Kahn? Yeah, they. Um, uh, I think they had a, a, a similar. Um, vision or, or, or were inspired by the monumental and uh, for certainly clean lines and uh, a more minimalist uh, approach. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would put them uh, in, in, in the same grouping in, in, in that way. They also, uh, you know, sort of found their way as, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, slightly celebrity or uh, you know hard charging uh, architects and artists uh, that that made their way and made, kind of made a splash in the culture, um, a little bit controversial. Um, so yes, many similarities. Um, so it seems fairly easy to throw out the modernist bathwater and keep the baby you know in rich countries. Um, but how do you do that in a place like Lagos, and do you see signs of that happening? Well, the, um, that's really the, the, the challenge. Uh, um, these, uh, these incredible cities uh, just having uh, an awesome influx of just millions and millions of people. And so the it's a, it's a central challenge for, for planning and for city building is how to accommodate that with safe, decent housing, uh, but uh, not in sort of soulless big housing blocks uh, that don't make any sense, that are a long way from uh, places uh, to work, um, and uh, you know that we just don't keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And so that's why I suggested that What's much more in vogue now is to, is to sort of think more in terms of Jane Jacobs and Greenwich Village, but the, but the problem, is, the dilemma is, is that we need more height and density uh, to accommodate this, these in, uh, uh, expanding urban populations. Um, so I mean, it sounds simplistic to say so, but some sort of blend of Jane Jacobs and Le Corbusier as might, might be part of the future for these for these global cities. Uh, let's say talking about him as, as a modern man is something that like we see, <coughs> would have uh, something that's sustainable in his work that you know would hold great promise for the future. Um, what buildings or even plans do you think uh, you could point to which were which are really compelling modules or building blocks for this future? Well, it, it's interesting. He, he um, was one of the first, or, uh, if not the first, uh, to, to uh, deploy a green roof, for example, at Villa Le Loc and also at La Tourette. Um, so again, he's working with nature. He's being, he's being quite environmentally progressive in ways that um, uh, you know, presaged, of course, now it, it's all about green building and, and, and that's really become the standard to, you know, to have LEED certification and so <coughs> forth. And so he was, he was dabbling that back in the, uh, dabbling in that back in the 1920s. 
Um, and then uh, I think what you can sort of take from places like Unité d'Habitation is this well-designed density idea that uh, these apartments, they were, they were duplexes, they went, uh, you know, they were floor-throughs, they had windows at either end, and a very compact, um, uh, you, you go through, you go through some of the apartments and uh, uh, it's like it was it, uh, out, straight out of an Ikea catalog, you know, just very um, uh, sleek and, and simple and, and compact and efficient, uh, sliding uh, doors and um, somewhat similar to um, the ocean liners that he traveled on. And so Unité d'Habitation has been called the, uh, uh, you know, the great ocean liner on land. Um, so uh, the, the green building and the compact, efficient housing design are, are, are two things that I would take out of his uh, work that are very, quite relevant for, for, for today. Yeah, I just think one other thing that's kind of really intriguing and, uh, you know, going back to his realist and then looking at almost any aspect in, in so many of his projects is that uh, there's always the, you know, manipulation of the cube and of the architecture and everything, but there's always the, uh, clearly the artist, you know, the artist's hand in everything, even if he's just painting the frame of a window with colors or it's just, you know, it's not just modern, slick, you know, New York penthouse, like really attractive architecture for the for the stars. You know, it's there's a, there's a there's a kind of a nitty gritty artist at work. Yeah, yeah, no, I think he he considered himself very much an artist, and um, when the, you you could look look at a number of places, but uh, where this really comes through is the chapel at Rochon, which I. Anybody ever has the opportunity to visit? It's uh, really, really stunning building and a wonderful site. Uh, and um, Renzo Piano actually just uh, created a visitor center. Um, and uh, uh, when I was there, there was a wonderful group that uh, sang a hymn, uh, and the acoustics are incredible. The light is incredible, and so I think the artist at work was at work very much so at the Chapel of Rochon. All right, so are we, we, we may be approaching our, uh, our allotted time. I have it as 8.05, so should we wrap it up? And, and I would be happy to talk further and uh, certainly to, um, to sign books. I very much appreciate uh, that and you having them here. And thank you once again to the uh, Brookline Adult and uh, Community Education Program for having me. Thank you very much.